Okay, uh, I have on my list a whole uh, large list in the description uh, of our passages. I tried desperately this morning to get it so that you could... Um, oh, hey Carl, glad you're on too. Um, in these whole... I, I just couldn't <laughs> get my PowerPoint to work with my preaching doing it live. I can record it and then do it otherwise, but for some reason this morning I couldn't get it to... Uh, to do it for us live on Facebook. So I have the list of scriptures that we're going to go through throughout this sermon. And there is a bunch of them, and they're all found all over the scripture. And the reason I have that is because I want to make sure that everything that you hear from me this morning is directly from God's Word. That it's, hey, Aunt Shell, glad to see you on. That it's all over the scripture. It's not just found in one little passage of one writer, but this is the tenor of scripture all the way across. Um, and you will need your Bibles this morning. Hey, Jay, good, good morning. This morning I want to give you the red or the blue pill. Hey, Thelma, I'm glad you're on all the way from Papua New Guinea. Woohoo! Cassidy, good morning. The red or the blue pill. I don't know if any of you have seen um, the movie The Matrix, but in The Matrix, uh, the man is given the choice of a red pill or a blue pill. And the red pill is one that says you're no longer safe. Uh, things in your life are about to get dangerous, but it's the honest truth. The blue pill, if you take it, is you swallow it and you are blissfully ignorant. You are back to where you were, no problems, no questions asked, and just float on as if nothing ever happened. Well, this morning I'm going to ask you if you're going to take the red or the blue pill. And you better decide in a hurry. Because the red pill that I plan to give in this morning's sermon is not an easy one to swallow. It's a horse pill. <laughs> it's a big one. And it does not leave you safe. It leaves you in a dangerous spot. Um, but it is the truth. If you want to be lied to, if you want to be... I don't know. If you want to be blissfully ignorant then you probably don't want to watch any more of this sermon. Because from here on out, it gets difficult. But I promise that I'm giving you the truth of God's Word and its tenor all the way across from Genesis to Revelation. And you need to walk in obedience to it. The title of my sermon this morning is Jesus Learned Obedience, and So Should I. It's easy to hear what we want. It's okay. We like sermons where we hear the person speaking good blessings, you know, that all the good things that God's going to do for me and for me and through me, and those are wonderful, and we like to hear those. And I get a lot of amens when I preach those sermons. I also get a lot of amens when I'm preaching sermons that point out other people's sins and, you know, they shouldn't be doing that or they shouldn't be doing this. And I get a lot of amens there. But you know where people are the quietest when you're preaching? When you're preaching with your finger in their nose. And that's where we're going to be this morning. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33 is where we're going to begin. We're going to start with verse 13. All the way back in the Old Testament, God gives this message to the prophet and says, When I say to the righteous that he will surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness, and he commits iniquity, or sins. None of the righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the, the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing an iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has, none, he has done what is lawful and right. He will surely live. This is a warning. Well, first of all, this is the plan of salvation, isn't it? But this is, if you are committing sin and you turn around and you do what is right, you repent, you turn away from your sin to follow after God, 
you give back what you've stolen, you stay true to your word, if you stop the sin business, verse 15, then you're going to live. That's, that's wonderful. That's, that's hopeful. That's beautiful. But this is also a warning for those of us that call ourselves righteous, that call ourselves Christians. Don't be so sure of your walk. God tells Ezekiel to tell the righteous, listen, I tell you the righteous are going to live, but if you turn around and you go back to the sin life that you once lived in, you're going to die. Hey, good morning, Browns. Good morning, Don and Joy. Glad you're with us this morning. Don't be so sure of your spiritual walk. Take heed, he who thinks he stands, unless he falls, another scripture says. If we remain in our, st in our sins, we are still in our sins. We're obviously not saved from them if we're continuing to live in them. It is true that we're not saved by stop, by not committing sins. But it's also true that once you are saved, that you are to not continue living in your sins. There's supposed to be a life change. We have to repent. If you're going the wrong way in the road, and there's no turnoffs, what do you have to do? you got to make a U-turn. I was driving down Interstate 75 um, last week, last Saturday, as a matter of fact. And I'm driving through, and I've, ne I've seen something I never saw before. You know how they have the emergency-only lanes? And I've seen people turn around, and I've known of a few people, <clears throat> no names, uh, that have done it themselves. But this time, I saw a, a police officer sitting on the side of the road, and he's clocking people as they go by to hopefully, in his speed trap, give tickets. And I saw a person pull in front of him, drive right past him, and make the U-turn. So whatever it must have been that that person needed a U-turn, I mean, at the risk of getting a ticket, that was pretty serious. That was I don't know, maybe you all have seen that before. I just was kind of shocked by it and pretty amazed that the police officer, I guess he was more worried about those that were speeding than those that were making a U-turn. We need, if we're going in the wrong direction, not just to stop, but to make a U-turn. And that's what repentance is all about. You've heard the phrase that Jesus loves you too much to leave you where you are. And are we not thankful that he has not left us where we are? We, when we are saved, when we are righteous, we are now delivered from the penalty of sin. Sin no longer will convict us. It's thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. But we are also released at that moment from the power of sin. Sin no longer has dominion over us. But it takes the rest of our life to continue to fight that problem. Ultimately, in heaven, we will be released from the presence of sin. That will be fantastic. And I honestly don't think we can even comprehend what that's going to look like. But the goal here is that sin in each one of these places in our life initially, continually, and then eternally, sin is removed from us. He doesn't save us so that we can continue to sin. He saves us so that we are saved from our sin, to stop the sin. Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus said, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near me, with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Verse 9, he continues and says, and in vain they worship me. You know, everything's a vapor, it's all gone. That's your worship. If you say you're a Christian with your mouth, but your heart is far from the Lord. In vain they worship me, teaching doc as doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus came not to sin, save us in our sin, but to save us from our sin, that we might be delivered from it, pulled out of it, pulled away from it. That is true salvation. 
John 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you have to do what? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You're going to obey them. You're going to do them. And in the process, you're going to need help. So I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to live inside you to help you. Do you get the point of all of this? By the way, that's the introduction. Aren't you excited? Woohoo! That was a long introduction. Don't worry, the rest of the sermon's not <laughs> in proportion. So now I want to take us, with that in mind, that we are saved not in our sin, but from our sin, and that God calls us to be obedient, and that we should continue to do as he would has called us to, I want to take us to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, and we're going to start with verse 15. If in this little passage, the writer is trying to compare the high priest that the Jews understood to their great high priest who is Christ. And it says in verse 15 of chapter 4, we do not have, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now I want to take us, and he continues to talk about our great high priest Jesus, um, but I want to go down to the main focus of our sermon this morning. Let's go to chapter 5, verse 7. Skip down about, I don't know what it is, six verses, seven verses. Chapter 5, verse 7. Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Verse 8, though he was a son, capital S, though he was God in flesh of man, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, if there's words that don't stand out to you, I don't think you were listening very well. I want you to think about this. Jesus, verse 8, was the Son. He was the promised Son. He was God in flesh. Completely God, completely man, in one single person. What the writer of Hebrews says here is, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Woohoo, we get that. He lived a sinless life. He didn't make he didn't make sinful choices. He did not make selfish choices. No, he made the right choices at the right time. But look what it says. Verse 8 of chapter 5, he learned obedience. Learned. That means he didn't have everything. Uh-oh. Is that starting to mess with our theology a little bit? Is that starting to mess with our idea of who God is? Stick with me. But that's not all it says. Look at verse 9. And having been perfected. Now, wait a minute, isn't God perfect? Flat out, end stop, perfect, right? But that's not what the writer of Hebrews says here about Jesus. It says, having been perfected. That also means, same way it does that he learned obedience, he didn't have everything. Now, how do we explain that? What, what kind of answer do we give to that? Well, as always, when you have a question about the Bible, best place to find it is to study a little more and find it in the Bible, right? Notice how it said it in verse 8, that Jesus 
learned obedience how? By the things which he suffered. Let me ask you a question. If I say, or you say, perhaps to your spouse, whoever, I love you, and in the good times, you turn around when everything's hunky-dory, everything's going well, and you turn around and you only make selfish choices. You only buy the things that you want. You don't think of their needs. You don't think about what they care. Sonia needs a new set of clothes, and I'm going out and buying my own. Does that sound loving? Well, we'd obviously, well, no, Pastor, that's not loving at all. A person that loves someone is someone that thinks of that other person. Exactly. So how about this one? If I was to say to Sonia or you say to whoever that I love you in the good times and I make choices unselfishly for you, does that mean that I love you? We could possibly say yes, but probably the answer is still a maybe. Because what happens when we get to those vows that say for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do his part? You see, love is more than just making the right decisions. Hey, Scott, we are continuing to pray for Jackie. You better believe it. We're fasting and praying for her. Absolutely. Love is more than just making the right decisions on good days. Love is making the good decisions, the right decisions on the bad days too. So if I was to say to Sonia, in the times when she's hurt me, if I was to say to Sonia in the times when she's so sick now that I have to support her and take care of her, if I tell her in those times that I love her and that I back it up with actions, does that say I love her? Well, by then we'd say, oh yeah, pastor, that makes sense. Yes, of course, You, if you back up in the hard times what you said in the good times, it's proof positive that there's something there. You see, this is how Jesus learned obedience in the struggle. Jesus just didn't make the right decisions when it was convenient. He made the decisions when it was difficult, too. He didn't just say, I love God and I am going to do the right thing. But when the temptation came, he did it. He followed through. In so doing, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. But I want us to read verse 9 again. We have a definition of those who have eternal salvation. Well, what's the definition? It says here, verse 9, And having been perfected, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus learned obedience through the struggles in his life. He didn't just say that he was obedient. No, he followed through even when it cost him his life. And eternal salvation comes to those, by verse 9's admission, it comes to those who obey him and learn the same obedience. If he has done it, so should you and I. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start with verse 15. I believe I preached on this about two years ago, and ever since then this has haunted me as a pastor. Because I'm so worried that when I preach and when I give Bible studies and when I pray and counsel with people, that they hear the truth of God and then they end up getting down to judgment day and they're shocked. 
It terrifies me. It really does. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. We get this, right? I mean, this makes sense to us. And believe me, I don't want to take too much away because not this week, but maybe next week we're going to be into this passage in our Wednesday night Bible study. But we get this. If you do bad things, if you live a sinful life, you're a sinner, right? I mean, that makes sense. You do bad things, you're a bad person. No problem. But hold on, Jesus keeps going here. He says, verse 20, therefore, so Jesus is digging a little deeper into what he says by what he's just talked about. And he said, therefore, by your fruits you will know them. If they're doing bad things, they're bad people. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who, what, does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, salvation comes to those who obey him. Hebrews chapter 5, right? We just read that. Jesus says the same thing here in confirmation. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. 22, this should terrify us. This should want us to reevaluate our walk. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Many will say to me, many is the majority. There's going to be a whole lot of people that are going to call, that have called themselves Christians. They're going to go up on judgment day and they're going to be shocked when the Lord tells them, I don't know you. You practice lawlessness. See, we get what he said from verse 19 before. Sure. If you do bad things, you're a bad person. We get that. Here, these people were doing good things. They were preaching in his name. They were prophesying. They were casting out demons. They were doing many wonders. They were doing the things that you're supposed to. But it didn't mean that they were saved. You say, wait a minute, Jesus. Then how do we know? You just got done saying you'll know them by your fruits, but even the good fruits sometimes are bad. How do you know? If the majority of people that call themselves Christians are shocked and eternally wrong, we need to know if we're saved. We need to have it set in stone before we ever make it to the judgment. It's bad enough. I mean, there's a lot of people that are scared to die. They should be a whole lot more scared to die eternally. We need to have this set in stone. So how do we know that we have salvation? Well, Jesus still isn't done with what he's talking about. Verse 24, he uses therefore again. Jesus keeps digging deeper on what he's just talked about. He just talked about, by your fruits you'll know them. Then he got done talking. Then he said, um, the majority of people that call themselves by the name don't because they're practicing lawlessness, even though they're doing good things. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Does them. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will. Those who have done them. Salvation comes to those who obey him. I will liken him that obeys the sayings, verse 24, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock, 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is like the foolish man who builds his house on sand. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and, that, and beat on that house and it fell and great was the fall. Jesus is making the same point that the writer of Hebrews did. The writer of Hebrews starts out with Jesus and says that Jesus learned obedience through the sufferings of this life. He didn't just say it. When life got hard, he followed through on it. We, too, can know we are saved not by the good times. Because people can put on a mask in the good times. We can know by the hard times. We can know through the struggles of this life. You see, the same builder built this house, or two different builders built this house, and both of the houses were standing as long as there was no storm. There's a whole lot of hypocrites out there. They claim the name, but on the inside, they're broken. They don't read their word. They don't pray. They don't fellowship with other believers. No, they walk foreign. They call themselves Christians, and one of these days, they're going to be shocked because they're not obeying him. They're not doing what the scriptures say. And then when the storms start to hit and the house starts to get beat by life, we really know what's on the inside, don't we? Not just us. We don't just know it about ourselves, but everybody else around can see as well. The ones that are putting on the masks, the ones who are doing the good things so that everybody can see, but inside are hiding, their house isn't going to make it in the storms of life. That's the fruit that you'll see. The real good fruit is the fruit that survives the storm. The fruit that you don't want to eat is laying on the ground after the first wind. So, in summary, if we have to be obedient to be saved, and by the way, I only picked out a few verses. I had a plethora, and good grief, I had to cut down. You can find this all over the scriptures. If we have to be obedient to be saved, how do we know we're obedient? How, what do we have to do to be obedient? Well, first of all, we do things... We, mm -hmm. There's things that we know we're not supposed to do. You say, okay, pastor, where do you find those? Well, there's massive lifts all over the Bible. And I tried to put a bunch in this morning, and I just didn't have time. There's lists all through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, about people that are not going to have salvation. If the Scripture's foundation says that you're not going to make it, don't worry about lying to yourself that you're going to. His word's going to trump it. His word's going to rule over, and you're going to be lost. You may be shocked, but you're going to be lost. These are things that you cannot do and call yourself obedient. If, if the Bible says, don't do this, and I'm not just talking about the Ten Commandments. If the Bible says, don't do this, and it gives a whole bunch on the list, if you do them, you are being disobedient. And as we've already talked about, if you're being disobedient, salvation isn't for you. Am I saying this plain enough this morning? Also, how do you know you're obedient? You don't do the things that personally God has revealed to you that you shouldn't do. There are some things in this life that others can do and walk with the Lord, but God's told you specifically, don't do them. Alcoholics, they don't walk past the bar. And, you know, I could go down the whole list of things and you know what I'm talking about. Your sin, you don't make a way for sin. You don't get as close to the fence line as you can get so you don't go over. That's not the goal here. You have personal information from God, whether it's been reading in your scriptures or praying, and God says, do not do this. Don't go this way. And you don't do it. If you disobey that, you are being disobedient. And again, salvation isn't for you. 
But that's not all. Christianity is not a list of just don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. There's a whole host of things that we are told to do. And if we don't do what we are told to do, that's still being disobedient, isn't it? And again, if you're being disobedient, this salvation's not for you. These things are also found all over the scriptures. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And I'm going to step on a lot of toes this morning, I'm sure. Brace yourselves, put your seatbelt on. There's many self-proclaimed Christians that will be shocked on Judgment Day just because they haven't followed through on the Great Commission. He didn't say, okay, I want some of you to do this and some of you not to. I want some of you to follow this way. That's not what he said. He said, go. He didn't put any provisos. He said, go. And because we haven't followed the Great Commission, there's going to be a whole host of us Christians that are going to be on Judgment Day and we're going to be shocked because we haven't done what we were supposed to do. Or maybe he gives a parable of this, that when the master shows back up, he finds us servants not working. We're sitting in front of our TVs all in safety. Obedience is not just not doing a bunch of stuff, it's doing. If I tell my son to go take out the trash and he doesn't do it, that's still disobedient. So there's things that we know that we are to do. There's also things that you know that you are to do. Again, these are the same things. This is personal information as you've been reading your word, as you've been praying, and God says, others may do this, may not do this, but you are to do this. Sometimes it's lifelong. When I was saved and in school, I felt God, I was reading through uh, the book of Romans, and I felt God say, I want you to preach the rest of your life. Actually, preach to your generation is exactly what he said. And I thought, no, that's not really what it says. And so I kept reading, and I thought, well, maybe it was just the one verse, and I'm taking the one verse out of context, you know, trying to scoot around the problem. And so I, rest the, I read the rest of the chapter, and I was like, wow, all of this says that. But I'm sure I'm just reading into it. God really doesn't want me to be a preacher the rest of my life. And so I finally I prayed and I said, well, Lord, I know in this verse it says that. And I know in the rest of the chapter it says this. But if the commentaries, if the other, maybe I'm just reading it wrong. So if the people that have studied the Bible say this about the passage, then I'll know you're, you know, you're, this is what you want for me. But I'm pretty sure not. So then I go into the commentaries and guess what they were all saying? <laughs> We're all saying the same thing. <laughs> and God says, are you going to give up yet? Well, I know to this day, there may be times when I'm not preaching. But if I'm not in ministry somewhere, trying to explain the Bible, share the Bible with people, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's sin. That's how strongly I feel about it. Sometimes our what God tells us to do is lifelong. Sometimes what God tells us to do is day by day. Well, this week I want you to go do this. Sometimes it's minute by minute. And he says, you know what? I need you to go talk to that person. That's obedience. Salvation is for those who are obedient. <laughs> So now the personal question, so how are you faring through all of this information, huh? <laughs> it's not an easy one. Boy, I tell you what, it's like walking on glass, isn't it? I really, in all honesty, I don't mean in sincerity, I, I don't mean to be harsh. But I'm trying to be honest with God's word. I'm trying to tell you this now so that one day when you get to judgment day, you're not one of many, you're not one of the majority that's shocked. If you're not being obedient, salvation is not for you. If you can't 
be obedient. Ask for help. And Jesus promised John 14 that he would send you the helper. The helper. So that you can do it. One last slide. This is it, I promise. I want to take you to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. I told you, I, I cut out a ton of verses. <laughs> now the works of the flesh are evident, Paul says. And they are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here's one of those lists, the things you can't do. Verse 22. Oh, I love congr yeah, contractions, right? But... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified those old things you're not supposed to do, the flesh, with its passions and its desires. If we live in the Spirit, if we claim the name, let's walk in the Spirit. Let's back up our words by our actions. But I want, I want you to stay with me here. Because this entire sermon, I'm not talking about the good times. It's easy to be loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and have self-control when it's good times. That's the easy time. That's when anyone can claim it, even the hypocrites. I'm asking you, what do you find in your life when life starts beating on your spiritual house? When things start shaking? Just for a moment, I want you to think with me. What do you find in your life? Which list shows up? in the hard times. If you don't like what you see, it's time to rebuild the house and start on the right foundation. Amen? Today's the day of salvation. Don't be deceived. Don't be shocked on Judgment Day with the majority. Make sure right here and right now that you're clean from the inside out and that you've turned around and repented of your sins to walk the other way. In so doing, you know that salvation is for you. Let's pray together in closing. Our Heavenly Father, for each and every one of us listening and for those that will listen in the future, I ask that right now, in this moment, you would search our hearts. And see if there is any wicked way in us. Forgive us of our sin. And lead us into the way everlasting. Help us to make a U-turn. Not just apologize for the sin that we've done, but don't go back to it. If there's anything in our life like that right now, we ask that you would cleanse it from us. Put us with a focus in reality of judgment day in our eternal destiny. May we all be reevaluated by you in this moment. Help us in the days ahead that we would turn from our sin and that we would not do things that we would also do the things that we need to, to be obedient to you. 
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. God bless you. Now, I've left you with enough time. You might be able to catch a sermon that's a little more sugar-coated and a little easier to swallow. <laughs> God bless you all. Thanks for joining us.